And I'm very happy to present uh, part of our work here uh, in, this, uh, in this forum about predictive gene regulatory network models and how we use them to study aging and disease mechanisms. Before I go into this, I want to just give you the kind of the big motivation of, the, of what we are doing in the group and what, what kind of motivates me to go to the, you know, to do research every day or to go to work every day, which is actually to understand what makes each individual, or we can also talk about patients, unique, right? How can we use this? And then also how can we use this variation like difference in phenotypes, facial features, but of course also more medically relevant differences among us, like how we respond to drugs or how, what are the mutations in our cancers? How can we use this variation to actually understand basic biology and disease mechanisms? So when we think about this variation, you know, the effect on phenotypes is, is a multifactorial trait and it's driven by both environmental and genetic variation. And if we, if we think about it in a genetic space, we have made the, the field has made tremendous uh, progress in the past couple of years, past decade, I would almost say, where we, have now, where we are now able to link single nucleotide polymorphisms, roughly 200,000 of them, through these genome-wide association studies to tens of thousands of complex traits and diseases. On the other hand, from the environmental side, we know that the macroenvironment, as well as our kind of daily intake, for example, in nutrients, but also the, our kind of microenvironment within our bodies, including cells and microbes, have a tremendous impact on our, on, on our traits and phenotypes. And we, we believe, or there's a strong belief in the field that this has something to, to, to do uh, with epigenetics. Now, if you think about the big challenges in those two spaces, I think the key challenge in the genetics part is that we do have a lot of these, we know a lot of these SNPs, we know a lot of these variations that are actually associated with trait, but to, for the most part, they lie in these non-coding regulatory elements. So 95% don't directly fall into a coding protein. So we don't know exactly what they're doing. So I think the key challenge here is really a lack of interpretation. When we talk about the environmental impact, I think here we're still talking about a lack of data because still we don't know how the epigenetics, how this environmental impact has an impact on, on epigenetics and then how these epigenetic uh, differences lead to the complex traits. So I just wanna tell you these key challenges and also tell you what, are, what is now the kind of the real world impact of having this, of these challenges. Right? So in an ideal world, when you think about precision medicine, for example, what you would do is you would calculate for each person a lifetime risk based on the genetic profile of that person. And then based on the environmental exposure, you would calculate an epigenetic and a cumulative, uh, true epigenetic cumulative risk. And you would, when, each person, when a person gets sick, you would immediately understand the current molecular state and then propose a treatment. Now, of course, we all know that this is not possible and partially this is not possible because of these challenges, right? That we are not able to calculate a lifetime risk and we don't know how the environment actually impacts on epigenetic and how that really, um, leaves, uh, gets us to a cumulative risk. So what precision medicine or personalized medicine is doing at the moment is essentially taking biomarkers that can come from the genetics or from the environment and then inform current risk and treatment, which is of course much better than not taking these biomarkers into account. But what I'm proposing here is that if we take a systems epigenetics approach and we're trying to understand how the environment through signaling pathways or chromatin regulation has an impact on biomarkers and we can understand the genetic impact, for example, through quantitative trait loci mapping on these biomarkers, we can not only infirm current risk and treatment, but we could also start understanding the cause of certain diseases and, and conditions and propose personalized treatments. And this leads me to the vision of our group that we have, which is essentially trying to understand the epigenetic environmental um, impacts on the molecular level and we're doing that by doing multi-omics profiling across large cohorts. And we then develop these uh, disease and cell type specific regulatory network models um, for which we can then kind of integrate the environmental impact based on, uh, let's say something that comes to signaling through transcription factors to the genetic part. And the, the goal is to have these kind of patient specific, cell type specific um, networks that we can then try, start to predict uh, responses to certain perturbations. And then of course we take these responses and refine our model. Now, let me guide you a little bit to how we actually do these regulatory network models before I'm gonna show you some of the applications um, of how we use them. So if you think about gene regulatory network models, I think there's four specific building blocks that we need. We first need to define regulatory elements. What are these? Then we need to be able to measure kind of the activities of transcription factors and how they may impact on the regulatory elements. Then we need to connect all these three different things, the transcription factors, the regulatory elements, and the genes. And finally, we have to connect 
through the transcription factors to the upstream signal link pathways. Now for defining the regulatory elements, I think that we use a very basic uh, kind of definition of this, and I just want to put every, everybody here on the same level that you know what, we are, what I'm talking about. Essentially for me, regulatory elements are genomic positions that regulate transcription, for example, being in a promoter or enhancer of a gene. And the way we define them is essentially by chemical modifications of the histone tails, which can also be called chromatin marks. And there has been a lot of studies mostly driven or like a, to, a, to, a, to a great extent driven by the ENCODE project where, you, where they have studied these epigenetic marks in different cell types. For example, in cell type one, you have very active environment and a lot of gene expression. In cell type two, you have very repressive chromatin environment and no gene expression. And now the, a, a bit of a bigger challenge is now not looking between the cell types, but actually within the cell time and now compare individuals. Right? Because now you're looking at much more subtle differences of how individual A may be different from individual B. And this is one of the challenges that we have to address here. But by and large, just to summarize this point, we essentially define regulatory elements uh, by using chromatin marks. Now the, sec the second point is uh, to measure transcription factor activities. And transcription factors are quite uh, challenging proteins because first of all, they're quite lowly abundant on the protein level. Uh, and I, I'm illustrating this here. When we look at uh, transcription factors, this is from one of our preliminary data set, but essentially this is true for any multiomics data set. When you look at the genes that are detected by protein level, on the protein level, on the RNA level, or just by kind of accessibility in the promoter um, region, you find that proteins are specifically depleted for sequence specific transcription factors. Now, also the RNA, even though it captures a lot of the transcription factors, is not ideally suited because transcription factors often are heavily post-translationally regulated. So looking at the RNA level may not be very informative for the actual activity of transcription factors. On the other hand, what we can do very well is to predict transcription factor binding sites on the genome. And we can also very easily measure chromatin modifications using ChIP-seq, for example. So we have um, used this. Uh, these two things to actually um, develop an approach where we combine transcription factor binding site predictions and chromatin signal to estimate the difference in transcription factor activity, for example, in two cohorts. So essentially what we're doing, we, we look for transcription factor binding sites here for the pink transcription factor, and we measure the chromatin activity or the chromatin modifications in the vicinity. And then from these two pictures, for example, we will conclude that the transcription factor is much more active in this cohort than it is in this cohort. This, um, this approach has been formalized in a, in a tool that we have, that we have uh, published and that you can use if you're interested, um, which is called DFTF, which essentially takes in any kind of chromatin modification or chromatin accessibility data, combines it with transcription factor binding sites, and then outputs differences in transcription factor activity across two groups. This has been successfully applied in many different projects to detect differences in TF activities, for example, in leukemia, during differentiation, in certain diseases and so on. I'm not going to go much uh, more into this uh, because I will come back to this later in the talk, but I just want to mention here to kind of bring this back to the big picture that we now can use chromatin not only to define the regulatory elements, but at the same time, we can also use it as a readout of transcription factor activity. So this defines our first two steps, um, how we define regulatory elements and, you, and measure transcription factor activity. And now the most challenging part comes to connect these transcription factors now to the target gene. And now of course, there has been a lot of work um, of co-expression networks, codependency networks, TF knockout um, or knockdown networks, you know, where you can map transcription factors directly to the target genes. However, what we are specifically interested in is not looking only at the target genes, but we want to understand the effect on the SNPs. So we want to look at these 95% um, of the SNPs that are in the non-coding regions, which means we need to include of the regulatory elements. So this essentially means that we have to split up our challenge into two parts. First, we have to connect the transcription factors to the regulatory elements, and then again, the regulatory elements to the target genes. And the way we're doing that is we're using this approach that we correlate essentially transcription factor expression across individuals, and this is now large cohorts of individuals uh, with, the, with the activity of their regulatory elements at the binding, at the elements that have a transcription factor binding site for this specific factor and use the non-targeted sites that don't have a binding site as a, as a background. And then similarly, we again uh, use a correlation approach uh, with physical proximity, for example, with high C data to link the, the regulatory elements, for example, enhancers to the target genes 
And we have again formalized this in a, in a tool and this, you can use this tool actually on our, we have it on our GitHub, which is a, it's, it's a, a user-friendly R package. So one thing I wanna emphasize here is that here we're not only looking at positive correlations of transcription factors with their target regions, but we also looking actually at negative correlations when the correlation coefficient is below zero or significantly below zero. And what, I, what, I, what we think that we can do with this is we can essentially separate transcription factors into those that act mostly as a repressor for which we would expect actually the correlation between their expression level and the activity at their target size to be slightly shifted towards a negative correlation. Um, and the ones for the activators, we would of course expect that the correlation between their expression level and the activity at their target size would be shifted towards a positive correlation. When we look at specific enhancers and kind of the accessibility of chromatin, uh, sorry, of transcription factors, for example, an activator, STAT5, stat we see indeed that if we look now at the transcription factor binding site, so this is transcription factor at base pair difference from the binding site of the transcription factor, plus minus 100 base pairs, we see indeed there's a, a bit of lack of accessibility right at the binding site, which is because the transcription factor binds there. But then the chromatin, incre the chromatin accessibility increases Right, surround, right in the surrounding, which means that the nucleosomes are probably not occupying this space. For repressor, and REST is here a typical repressor, we find a very different pattern. We find a bit of accessibility right there at the binding site, which means the transcription factor is probably binding and, and releasing its binding. But then in the vicinity is actually very closely, uh, the chromatin is very close. So here in gray is the average level we expect across the genome. But what we see is actually the, the, the accessibility is below this. Now, we had these predictions now that we can make for, for all our transcription factors, and we wanted to somehow validate this. However, when we looked at the literature, and we looked here, for example, at the TRAS database, which, which essentially uh, curates known transcription factor target interactions and whether they're activating or repressing. And what was really striking, we have now here all the transcription factors, and essentially for all the transcription factors, we find classifications that they are supposed to act as a repressor and others that are the same transcription factor supposed to act as an activator. And there was really no pattern of whether transcription factor is more activating or more repressing. So we thought, okay, we have this prediction. Now we have to actually validate this in a more, um, you know, more experimental way because it doesn't work with, uh, with the publicly available data. There is no consensus. So we went to our collaborators and essentially classified transcription factors based on available data from, for a leukemia cohort. We then took our own leukemia cohort and treated them with ibutrinib and check whether now the transcription factor activity on chromatin is correlated or anti-correlated with its, uh, with its uh, change in expression. So essentially what we would expect for transcription activator, that there would be a positive association between a change in transcription factor abundance and the expression level of the target and consequently also on the chromatin accessibility. And for the transcription repressors, we would expect a negative correlation so we would expect a lot of expression of their targets when they're not present and also the chromatin would be accessible and we would not expect an expression when they are present. And indeed, when we looked at this, the change in chromatin-based uh, transcription factor activity versus their expression, we find indeed a positive association for the transcription factors that we classify as activators and we find a negative correlation for the transcription factors that, that we classify as repressors. So going back, now with this observation to our network, now we have to of course change our arrows and we cannot just simply have them all the same way, but we actually have to separate them into activating and repressing arrows. Now what we have done is we have now built these regulatory networks across many different cell types. And what you can see here is the different cell types and our classifications of whether transcription factor was classified as activator in blue or as repressor in red. And you see for the most part, this kind of nicely agrees across cell types, which means transcription factors often have a, a similar role across different cell types. However, there's some very interesting exceptions to this. I'm just uh, showing you a couple of them here, where we find specific differences between the hematopoietic cells uh, of the myeloid lineage, like macrophages, and the lymphoid lineage, like T cells. And I think this, very, this will be very interesting to follow up, and it's very important to keep in mind that depending on the context, your transcription factor can either act as a repressor or it can act as an activator. So now that we have these regulatory networks, of course, we need to see, okay, what can we now do with them? And what we thought we could do is to actually put them to test and see whether we can actually use them for predicting some kind of interesting response. And what we did here is we took the um, data from, uh, that was published before in Nature Genetics from 10, 2018, 
and where they have profiled macrophages, chromatin accessibility, and uh, and uh, gene expression in 80 individuals. We generated a gene regulatory network, and then we asked, okay, if we now say we still we take the the data that they have also for stimulating the macrophages, and we now train a model that predicts differential expression based on our network and a random forest uh, using a random forest framework. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we, you know our network actually does something to the you know adds something to the prediction. And what we did find is that when we use our network, we we can generate a very nice predictive model for macrophage differential expression with an R squared of a pound of, of about 0 0.25. But actually, if you look at the directionality, we we pretty much get um, almost uh, all of the directions of the of the gene expression changes are in the right direction. So you can see here, this is our predicted log twofold change, and this is the true log twofold change. And what is very important to note here, if we randomize our, randomize our network or we randomize the gene expression uh, levels, we don't get any prediction. So this is really very specific to our cell type specific network. And what was now very interesting is we now have different networks. We don't only have the one from the macrophages, we actually have networks from all different cell types. And what we find now, if we again want to predict this response in macrophages to stimulation uh, with, uh, with Salmonella, we find we get a very nice predictive response for the macrophages. But when we use naive T cells, iPS cell line, or brain, or even acute myeloid leukemia cells with uh, networks, we don't get this prediction. So our prediction is really very cell type specific, which now gives us a tool that we can now actually overlay this with patient specific data and get a cell type specific response for specific um, uh, diseases. And uh, just to summarize this part now, we have linked now, we have now a, a framework that, where, where we can link transcription factors to genes through, this, uh, through chromatin associations, and we get a very cell type specific predictive models using that. Now for the final part, how we can now connect these transcription factors to signaling, I want to show you um, two examples. And these are now uh, my case studies that I want to show you how we can now integrate environmental factors with a, with a potentially genetic variant. And the first thing actually I want to want to mention is not so much the genetics, but more the epigenetics. Uh, and this is about the disease mechanism that we have tried to study using this approach in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, just to give you a brief overview of what pulmonary arterial hypertension is, it is essentially a very a devastating disease. Um, you get uh, the only the only treatment to the disease is um, lung transplantation. It is a rare disease. That's why our also cohort was pretty small. But essentially what happens is that in your pulmonary arteries, the smooth muscle cells start proliferating like crazy and you shrink the volume of your pulmonary, of your pulmonary arteries and essentially you start um, getting strokes and all kinds of adverse effects. Um, and as I said, the only treatment is so far lung transplantation. And in the, in the healthy individuals, what you usually have, you have one layer of endothelium and then you have one layer of smooth muscle cells and then the connective tissue. So what we had in this study, is we took this in the very first uh, inner layer of endothelial cells, we cultured it for two days to get rid of any kind of you know, patient-specific um, effects or kind of treatment-specific effects uh, that these patients get. We then get um, different types of chromatin marks, enhancer marks, promoter marks, and also active marks, 3D chromatin marks, and RNA-seq um, expression data. And when we look at just a very simple differential expression, what we find is that there's actually zero differentially expressed genes now between these uh, healthy and the patients. And this may be because the cells have been cultured for two days, right? We lose kind of the immediate signals. However, what we find is about 11,000 differentially active enhancers. And when we do um, uh, employ our DFTF, our differential TF activity quantification, we find many differentially active TF that actually recapitulate the known disease. And I'm, I'm showing you this here in black. So in black are all the transcription factors that we know are associated with the disease. But what's very striking is that we find a lot of transcription factors that were even more significantly different between patients and controls that were not known to be associated with the disease. So then we were at this, at this, uh, at this uh, you know, we had this question, essentially, we have a lot of differential signal in the enhancers. We know that the transcription factors recapitulate the disease. So what can we now learn about these TFs, um, from these TFs about the disease? And of course, what we did is we built this uh, enhanced immediate gene regulatory network that I showed you before, um, how we build it. And we get now a big network. We have transcription factors up in the controls, up in the patients, and then we have connected them to the target genes. And when we look at the goal, goal terms that are enriched among the target genes, 
what was quite striking is that we find a lot of these terms that are related with the kind of smooth muscle cell differentiation, mesoderm development, and so on. And remember, these are endothelial cells, but the phenotype of the, of the disease is essentially this overproliferation of smooth muscle cells. So we thought this could be some connection here. And another very interesting term that we found was this response to transforming a, a growth factor beta, so the TGF beta response. So what was, what we thought is, okay, now let's take our network and let's now get the genes that we have for which we predict there would be a differential response based on enhancers and TF activity. Um, and since they are related to response to TGF beta, we thought, okay, let's stimulate now the cells with TGF beta and specifically look at the genes for which we have this different priming. And what I'm showing you here, here is the data, here is the schematic. Essentially, what we find is that the, the, the differential enhancer activity that we predict for these genes actually shows as differential expression um, in the pH versus control. So essentially, what we find is that the genes that were open, that had open accessibility for an, or like active enhancers in pH indeed responded in the pH, whereas they didn't they respond in the control. And since the, the target genes were all related to smooth muscle cell differentiation, what we believe is that they may have some signaling um, that they can send to the endothelial cells or to the smooth muscle cell to increase this proliferation. So this is one example of, of how we can now use these networks to get a, a better understanding of disease mechanism. And now I want to show you a second example where we look at aging, because aging is also a very interesting phenotype. It kind of, um, by definition, it kind of acquires these epigenetic changes, right? Because with age, you have all these environmental impacts that happens to you. So we, we, we thought to study the aging of the bone marrow niche derived mesenchymal stroma cells. And the reason we think these are interesting cells is because they actually have, so they, they, these are kind of stem cells or mesenchymal stroma or stem cells in the bone marrow, they can differentiate in the osteoblast and adipocytes. And what is very important is they have an, a very supportive role or they have a supportive maintenance role of hematopoietic stem cells, which are the core cells that uh, drive the immune system. And since many age-related diseases are actually related to the immune system, we thought they may have some impact on some of these um, kind of age-related, immune-related um, diseases. So the way we, the way we collected our data was essentially we took this um, from a cohort of healthy individuals to chromatin accessibility, transcriptomics, and proteomics data that we profiled. And just to give you an overview, this is actually the same data that I showed you before. But just to visualize this kind of more dramatically, I think this is very important to, to know, uh, to kind of to, to emphasize here, is that when we look at ataxic, we can quantify, you know, most, most of the genes based on ataxic uh, expression uh, accessibility. On, in the promoters, we can also quantify most genes by RNA-seq based on the expression level of their transcript. However, the proteomics data, we really have a severe blind spot of genes that are, that are mostly the ones that are lowly expressed and specifically transcription factors. So we thought in this case that we can actually use our transcription factor activity to kind of fill this blind spot that we get from the proteomics data to look at the effect of transcription factors, which may be important for kind of this differentiation profile of the, of the aging mesenchymal stroma cells. So first we wanted to know how does, how does aging affect each of these layers? And what was quite striking, I'm showing you here, just these are all the genes, all the age sensitive genes that are age sensitive at least in at least one layer. And what you can see is that there's mostly not overlapping. So they're either um, age sensitive on the chromatin, on the protein or on the TF activity. Another striking fact is there was absolutely no effect on the RNA. So again, kind of, showing that RNA may be not capturing kind of the cellular state very, very well, like similar to what we saw, but we also observed in the, in the pH data. There was what's quite interesting in the chromatin was that this was strongly enriched for bivalent regions and bivalent regions are, are very important for stem cell differentiation. So these are the regions that may close down once the cells differentiate into more um, mature cell types. What well, we find essentially that these regions close with age. So it looks like the, the cells are losing some kind of stemness um, during, the, um, during aging. Another very interesting kind of observation, which could explain why we don't see anything on the RNA, but we find stuff on, the, we find changes on the chromatin and on the protein level, is that chromatin-related proteins like uh, chromatin modification enzyme, remodeling enzyme, were all downregulated with aging. 
So this could explain kind of the effect that we see on the chromatin. It could Im imply that actually this, the aging starts on the protein level, which then propagates to the chromatin. Now, the most interesting phenotype actually came from transcription factor activity. And what we did here is simply because one of the known phenotypes um, that, is, that is known in aging is that you lose, um, with age, you lose osteoblasts and you gain adipocyte. So your bone marrow becomes more fatty and less bony. And what we now did is we essentially categorized our transcription factors into those that are involved in adipogenesis, so fat differentiation, and those in, in osteogenesis, so bone differentiation. And they, they pretty much split into young and old. So the old ones had more active um, adipogenesis, and the young ones had more active osteogenesis. Now, we wanted to um, kind of follow up on this molecular um, uh, observation. And what we, did, what we did here is we used the data set that was published 2019 uh, from Rauch et al, where they did a really nice uh, multiomics data set of mesenchymal stem cell differentiation into adipocyte and osteoblasts. And we used this data, again, using the same approach that I showed you before to build a gene regulatory network uh, with these numbers of connections, so roughly 3,000 connections, 160 transcription factors, um, around 2,000 target genes, and then about um, 1,000 peaks that we find in our MSCs that, we, that they also find in their data. And now when we, when we connected the transcription factors that were upregulated in the young and downregulated in the old, what we found is they were essentially enriched for being connected to target genes that were downregulated in adipogenesis, and, and they were um, uh, depleted for genes that are upregulated in adipogenesis. So what we think is happening here is that these transcription factors, indeed, in, in our MSCs, in aging, they kind of prime the cells towards um, adipogenesis. So we do find the signal on the transcription factors and on the regulatory element, but we don't find it, as I showed you, we don't find it on the gene expression. So I think this has very inter interesting implications. And we could now, we, we are now using this data. So this I'm showing you here is preliminary data. We're now using this data of age-dependent um, chromatin priming, how this may impact um, um, the differentiation potential of MSCs and potentially also regulate uh, the immune phenotypes. So kind of as a summary of these last two case studies, that what I, what I want to bring home here is that it's really important to, to keep environment, to kind of take the chromatin potential into account when you look at the environmental signal. Right? So in a chromatin potential, let's say in the pH patients or in the young individuals, having a signaling doesn't have any impact because the chromatin is essentially closed. Whereas in another, state, for example, in the pH patients or in the older individuals, this may have an impact, the signaling may have an impact because the chromatin is essentially accessible and, uh, and primed to respond um, to a specific differential expression and potentially differential phenotype. So to summarize what I have been talking about here um, is we have now an opportunity to connect the cell state with the cell potential by looking at this interaction of the chromatin state and the signaling component. So this brings me back to our overall vision. So what I've shown you is how we build our networks, how we can make them a cell type um, specific, how we can use them to predict response and perturbations. And I haven't shown you actually how we can integrate the genetics part, but this is something that we are currently working on. And essentially, it, is, it involves overlaying our networks now with, with the uh, regulatory elements that are connected to genome-wide uh, true genome-wide association studies um, with complex traits and diseases. So final take home message, I've shown you that we can use um, these kind of global gene regulatory networks to understand molecular mechanisms of transcription factor activity. For example, we can classify transcription factors into activators and repressors. And we saw that this can be, put, for some transcription factors, very cell type specific. I showed you that we can use these networks now to predict cell type specific perturbation responses. And then now, of course, we can now in investigate what is driving these responses and how can we potentially in, in, um, intersect them if we want to, um, for example, inhibit one of these responses. I've shown you how we can use chromatin, how we have identified chromatin mediated enhancer priming as a disease mechanism in pulmonary arterial hypertension or PH. And I've also shown you how we have, how we have found chromatin mediated priming in aging of the bone marrow niche and that, that we found that, uh, that mesenchymal stroma cells kind of are primed towards adipogenesis in the old individuals. So with that, I want to just acknowledge uh, the people in my group. Um, I've, uh, I had the, their pictures on, their on, their, on my slides, and just to mention the names again, 
Christian Arnold and, uh, and Ivan Veras were mostly involved in the Transcription Factor Activity um, project. Armando Reyes Palomares uh, is, uh, together with Christian, has worked on the Transcription Factor and on the Gene Regulatory Network. Uh, Brian and, and uh, Mariana are driving the aging project. And Ariane has been working a lot on the predictive response of Transcription Factor um, on the regulatory networks. And with that, I would like to thank you and the Nucleum Consortium for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. What I'm interested, you said that in different tissues, transcription factors can act as activators and uh, suppressors. But uh, how do you consider uh, um, a transcription pulsing. Um, how do you consider the things that the, the same factor can uh, have a feedbacks and can be, you know, on and off? Do you consider it somehow, or uh, your uh, um, your uh, design excludes uh, such uh, approaches, or it is not? Well, so I mean, we are looking mostly at the global effect, right? So we're looking at um how transcription factors overall across all their binding sites act. So we do, we do of course, see also that at, at certain binding sites, they, they act in the opposite direction. And, and I think what, what we are looking at is, is not something specific to a transcription factor targeting interaction. So it's really a global picture of the transcription factor. And what we find is that this will be, that, that this is very cell type specific. And that's what I find interesting, right? Because then you can ask, okay, so what makes it cell type specific? Is there potentially like collaborative transcription factors that are cooperating with this transcription factor in specific cell types to have one action or another? Or are there other kind of chromatin modification factors that are not expressed or differentially expressed? Is it different isoforms of the transcription factors? So I think there's a lot of, diff a lot of questions of how they would achieve these global um, changes. But it doesn't, we don't look at individual sites. So like within, at an individual site, there can always be more kind of mechanisms that, that we wouldn't capture in our global approach. Your data about aging and bivalency are very interesting. Can you tell in a few words uh, the uh, model? So what you compared with what? What means young, what means uh, old? What was uh, the, the yes okay so I can I can tell you that so so we had I mean our cohort was uh, um, between twenty and sixty years old and we had a, a three group design so we considered people between twenty and and thirty years as young and then between thirty and fifty years as middle and then between fifty and sixty years old I mean this was just um, the cohort that we have so that's how we stratify the people and that's what we uh, that's the responses or that's like the the regressions that we looked for. Thank you. And the last question, which uh, leukemia have you studied? Which kind of le leukemia? You just said leukemia, what was it? This was the acute myeloid leukemia that we, are, that we are studying, yes. Thank you. So Mark asks, Mark Marty Renom asks, thanks for your talk, Judith. I may be misinterpreting your results wrongly, but it seems to me that RNA-seq, so gene expression, may not be the best measure for outcome of a regulatory network. Is that true? And how could you overcome this limitation? Um, I'm not sure whether it's the wrong, but it's, I, I think there's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's clearly the availability of RNA-seq is what makes it so useful, right? Because we have a lot of RNA-seq data sets, but in principle, I totally agree with you. In principule, you know, having something like uh, growth-seq, you know, that would actually measure that, the, initiation of transcription, because really what we're looking at is kind of the, you know, the chromatin relating to the transcription event. We're not really interested in the kind of the um, um, equilibrium of RNA levels. But I think the, the limitation is simply that RNA-seq is currently the standard um, protocol that people use, and it's very easy to use. So ideally, we would use something like nascent transcription, because that's what we're actually looking at. Um, yes, or we should, or we could, in, we, we could uh, kind of include more downstream, like kind of more RNA stabilizing factors as well in our networks, which we haven't considered so far. 
maybe I can slip in a kind of related question, which is, um, so when you mentioned that you were taking into account the uh, chromatin modification, which, which is the most powerful readout? Is it accessibility? Powerful in the sense of, you know, you get the best, um, the best prediction. Yeah, so I mean, I think that I think the the best would be in brain would actually be H three K twenty seven acetylation. I think that's the most related to transcription, like the that that gives you the most kind of activating signal. The accessibility is kind of a is is kind of a good proxy. So you find a lot, um, you know, it, it it's highly correlated with with acetylation, except for the promoter regions. So the promoter regions I think are very poorly predicted actually by acetylation because there you often have probably have polymerase pausing or all kinds of other factors that makes a promoter accessible, even if it's not active. So I think that's why for enhancers, I think the signal is fine. Also the signal is highly correlated, but for, for promoters, isolation is definitely a better signal. Good. And then uh, Geneviève Fourel asks, um, so when you were talking about repressors, you think they act via K27 trimethyl or K9 trimethyl? Yeah, this is a great question, actually. We should look at this. I mean, so what we have done is we have actually taken the, so we have taken the transcription factors that we predict as repressors and looked at their target sites. And then we looked in, the, we, we took the, the chrom HMM states from the epigenetic roadmap. And they were mostly enriched for these repressive chromatin states. So I guess the, kind of based on, on the, based on these marks. So we haven't looked directly at these marks, but we have looked at kind of epigenetic states that are driven by these marks. Um, but we, we, we haven't looked at this, you know, specifically, but I think this is actually a nice suggestion. Maybe this is something we should follow up. Yes. Uh, thank you, Judith, for the, for the nice talk. It, it's more a general question. So uh, in, in, your, uh, in your analysis, you always compare groups of people. So how do you think you will be able to go towards individual, okay, where you really, can look at the networks or what's going on at the individual level instead of the group level. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I say individual, but I, I mean, I think there's always a way to, that you can stratify your groups, right? I mean, but an individual is then part of multiple groups. I mean, ideally you could um, look, so if you have, for example, let's say you have in an individual, you have, let's say treatment and response, or so you have healthy and, and disease or like tissues. You know, then you can make this this comparison be, within an individual. Um, at the moment, I wouldn't be. I, I don't think we can actually quantify absolute states. I think we always rely on differences, kind of a baseline for, from which we want to compare it. Um, so mm -hmm. that that's so. So individual is maybe a little bit over overstating it. So what I what I mean with individual is really kind of a specific class. You know. Uh, so um, when you say that that you deal with uh, chromatin accessibility you mean a, a taxi right yes okay and or dhs actually we use both oh, you, you use both. yes yes okay so so maybe uh, the first question would be could you please comment which one of these two is better in, in your hands i think well i think they're very very comparable i think attack for in well if we produce the data so we, we i mean maybe i should have stated that also my, my group is mostly computational so we have like 80 percent computational and 20 percent experimental and when we do experiments we always do a taxi because the protocol is just much easier for us we have it established but it it, it is really very very similar so i don't think there is a big uh, difference in, in terms, in of, terms the of the results the... yeah I just find it easier to do experimentally. In terms of the prediction power. In terms right? of the prediction power, yes. I mean, in our in our models, there is not much difference, and they overlap really well. The peaks we get from both. Thank you very much. And the second question: So, when you say you you quantitatively assess this data, do you? treat them as yes or no when when you apply some thresholds and say the peak appeared disappeared no or... we usually do it quantitatively so we you, look you at quantify. full changes yes we look at full changes okay and when you quantify the peak so i guess an ataxic peak it represents some enhancer or so some site where uh, several transcription factors could bind Mm -hmm. um, so how do you infer from this uh, that 
the binding of this particular transcription factor changed and not the yes so so this is you the, know the, i think this is um this is of course a simplification so what, what i think what our networks do is they kind of limit hypotheses of where a transcription factor can actually bind right because the standard is the standard is that you take your peak you look for a transcription factor motif and then you say okay so this transcription factor is binding there now, one additional requirement that we have is that the expression level of that transcription factor has to correlate with the size of the of the peak, right? which to me indicates so there has to be at least some relationship between the transcription factor and the target peak. Now, the peak is very unlikely to influence the transcription factor expression, so I think that's why we can kind of make this inference um, that it is likely that transcription factor has an impact on that enhancer. It doesn't mean that this is the only transcription factor that has an impact on the enhancer. It just means that this transcription factor likely has an impact on the activity or accessibility of this enhancer. Uh, one last very simple question. So this DPS tool that you developed, uh, does it also work on single cell? Um, for single cell, actually, there's another tool um, that if, you, if you're interested in that, you should uh, look at this tool. It's called Cromwar for chromatin variability. So where they actually quantify differential or like uh, kind of Express, uh, sorry, transcription factor activity per cell. So we didn't develop this because this was already developed. <laughs> we don't have to reinvent the wheel there. Sure.